our understanding of, of international relations really began with empire and it was conflict that led our understanding of how countries related to one another. It was driven by conflict, it was driven by power, it was driven by a desire uh, to control. As we evolved out of that need for conflict, so we developed political systems of international relations, uh, we developed those theories in academia, but at the same time, almost in parallel, you had the development of mass media and then internationalised mass media. While for a long time uh, the audience of consumers, people who consume news, people who consume, consume art and culture, um, have uh, had the access potentially to academia, it's been through the prism of mass media. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Professor Mersheimer, if I could start with you. Do you think an Iran with nuclear weapons could actually bring more stability to the region? And if so, how? I think there's no question that a nuclear armed Iran would make the Middle East more stable. The fact is that nuclear weapons are weapons of mass destruction. In any country that has nuclear weapons is not likely to be attacked, and that would make the region more peaceful. Academics have used mass media as a platform to be able to distribute their views, and then the mass media have used those theories to simplify and uh, as a, way, as, as a shorthand, to be able to frame their reporting of the world. The Israelis could attack uh, Iranian nuclear facilities, but they wouldn't be able to inflict long-term permanent damage. If Iran retaliates, every US ally in the region, or Israeli ally in the region, is a potential target. Iran's ally, Syria, could also join in. Plus, Iran's proxy forces, like Hezbollah in Lebanon, would fire rockets into Israel. It's very difficult to keep the international in the debate today because increasingly people don't care about things that happen outside of their families, their friends and the world uh, that, that they immediately exist in. Now, if you want a foreign story to make the top of the BBC evening news, it has to be a war or a natural disaster. Our priorities have clearly changed. International news has slid right down uh, to, the, to the bottom of the priority list. It's even worse in the United States, um, where most regional metropolitan newspapers do not have foreign bureaus anymore. Uh, even the Washington Post has closed its foreign bureaus, uh, relying on wire now. Agencies have allowed news organisations to increase the amount of coverage they can provide, but they've homogenised the news in a way that you end up with uh, one set of pictures that are used by a range of news agencies. Every newspaper is running the same coverage, they're running the same stories, the same quotes, the same talking to the same people, the same view. Um, so everyone's hearing exactly the same thing and nuance is pushed out of the picture. This is again the immediate aftermath from WHDA. If this does turn out to be a terrorism, don't immediately jump to conclusions. Tom, hey, he's one of the marathon runners. The worst possible thing you can imagine. You have a situation where two bombs go off in Boston and it's wall-to-wall -wall coverage. 31 bombs go off in Baghdad on the same day and it gets 30 seconds, if that. People killed in a wave of bomb attacks in Iraq on Monday morning. As many as 27 are said to have died with up to 200 hurt. If we really are going to run news channels 24 hours a day, maybe we could spend a bit of money looking at other things. I don't know. I mean, have you any idea what's going on in the Central African Republic? I don't. Uh, I don't know what's going on in Mongolia right now. I don't really even know what's going on in New Zealand right now. They'll see a bombing, they'll see an earthquake, they'll see a tsunami, and they'll see it from so many angles on the same, you know, the same pictures on the same, uh, on the different news organisations. It is almost because we, we've become so used to seeing images like that that it really does take something extraordinary now to, to make that kind of impact. Every time we accelerate the means of interacting with one another, society gets turned upside down and inside out, and all of its structuring institutions transform in ways that were inconceivable to the prior epoch. If we look to, to categorize the, the current cultural epoch, the epoch of electric communication, I would describe that as one of uh, ubiquitous connectivity and pervasive proximity.
shapes, even in hot soapy dishwater. Neat, fresh colored, almost invisible. Band-Aid plastic strips with new super stick stick better than any other bandage. Look at this amazing demonstration. Close, comfortable shave you've always wanted. Reach for the Remington electric shaver. It seems that capitalism means different things to different people. Good evening, Dr. Martin Luther King, the apostle of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. All of us in the world are connected either directly or indirectly, always, all the time, all of a sudden. Uh, what happens over there affects me here because there is no there, everywhere is here. Are you getting a TV picture now, Houston? Neil, yes, we are getting a TV picture. We cannot help but pay attention to everything that comes and give it relatively equal weight. I am paying for this microphone, Mr. The greatest divisions this nation has ever seen were the conflicts of trade unions towards the end of a Labour government. We're told in school to pay close attention to what comes to us. We collectively, as a global community, suffer from a technological ADHD. So the profound and the mundane, the, the trivial and, and the terrible, uh, all attract our attention in the same way. Meanwhile, the war in Bosnia continues. The Bosnian Serbs again shelling the supposedly safe areas of Bihać, Srebrenica, Gorazde, and Sarajevo. You either overload yourself with uh, sensory stimulation so that you numb yourself, or you go to, to a catatonic state in order to, to serve as a self-medication, as it were, or self-anesthesia. But it's indicative to me of the state that we have not learned the appropriate level of ignorance. The ability to pay attention to that which is important and prioritize uh, where we put our attention and our concern. What this means is that anyone who has a cause in which they believe, anyone who tries to do social good, anyone who um, needs to call attention to uh, social injustice must adopt ever increasing levels of uh, drama of uh, sometimes personal sacrifice in order to gain attention for what should be the concern of society. I think that a lot of the things that people criticise journalists and reporters for not doing can be done by other people and should be done by other people. It should be done by documentarians, it should be done by artists and illustrators even, writers. There are all I mean, things like Homage, uh, Homage to Catalonia, Down and Out in London, Paris by Orwell. These are, are famed works. Um, there's a role, there's definitely a role for that kind of material. What art and culture can do and the fact that that can be disseminated and distributed much more easily by people transnationally is can challenge all of those stereotypes, all those preconceptions that have been built up by international relations theory over the last two centuries. And that really does provide new outlets, new opportunities for artists, poets, writers, the people who can create ideas and disseminate them in different ways find new ways of telling their stories that will challenge uh, the traditional hegemony of, of, of the mass media. The artist is the distant early warning system of, uh, of a culture. All of these people who indulge in satire put on a society. They put them on in the, in the colloquial sense of making fun of them but also they put them on as almost a clothing, as external cover, so that the rest of society can see itself dressed in its own clothes. In that sense, it is the artist's job to live on the edge, to help us 
is collectively pay attention to what is important in a society. And this has to do with issues of social justice. It has to do with issues of equity and inequity, of power and so on. Through the spectacle of art, uh, be able to see the society from a, a different context and then understand a fundamental truth. That's not just the satirists. It is the, the artists whose work in any artistic realm hold up a mirror to the society and allow people to see themselves as they are, perhaps in a different context that reveals a new truth. So you do have this legacy media approach that characterizes um, states or countries or communities in very specific and very old world ways. Turmoil in the Central African Republic. The poorest and most unstable nations on earth. Millions will starve. The rebels have been marching towards Bungi for several months now. This bullet scarred building. One of the world's most dangerous and poverty stricken places. And poverty is rife. North Africa is becoming a magnet for jihadists. Northern Mali has become a magnet for foreign jihadists. The apocalyptic state. Child soldiers and amputations, their brutal trademarks. Rapes, armed robberies, and car hijackings. Now they had the chance through not just their own development of, of media systems, but also now through the internet. You have the ability of, of not just journalists, but artists, creatives, to actually challenge those traditional sources of information and say, here's the way of the world that's, that's different, that you maybe didn't know about. And what I think you'll find is that more and more people will see those in sources like social media, or on a Facebook link or Twitter, and they'll actually start actively following those uh, creative sources uh, and finding new stories that get away from the traditional diet of news and politics that we get from the international media. My name is Jacob Joyce. I'm a sculptor, painter and curator from South London and my artwork attempts to address the idea of the universal and try to provoke this idea of universal interdeviation. Yoruba is a language and orally practiced philosophy and religion from Benin, Togo and Nigeria and it's estimated that within the pantheon there are over 400 different deities. Each one of the deities represents an inevitable or essential part of our interaction with each other and with nature. Isu is the god of crossroads, beginnings, doorways and passageways. And one day, Isu passed through a town. As he passed through the town, everybody thought to themselves, who is that guy? No one recognised him. And after he'd left the town, a man on the right side of the road shouted to his neighbour on the left side of the road, hey, who is the guy who just passed through here wearing the red hat? And his neighbour on the left side of the road said, you mean the guy wearing the black hat who just passed through? Yeah, I saw him. And the first guy says, no, 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 it's definitely a red hat. And the second guy on the left side of the road, his wife leans out of her window and she says, no, my husband's right, it was a black hat, I saw it. And then the guy on the right side of the road, he says, well, no, actually, my, my son and my, my grandfather are sitting here and they saw it too. It was definitely a red hat, not a black hat. And the guy on the left side of the road says, you calling my wife a liar? Because she just told you that it was a black hat, not a red hat, and you're saying that's wrong. And the guy says, I'm not calling your wife a liar, but maybe she is lying because my whole family saw it and it was definitely a red hat, not a black hat. And more people start massing on either side of the road because they are all sure on one side that it was a black hat and they're all sure on the other side that it was a red hat. And suddenly this turns into a, into a fight. People start pushing each other and calling each other liars. Other stuff starts getting brought up. This starts to become something else, something not trivial at all. People start to, to punch each other and hit each other and tables start getting thrown, chairs start getting thrown. People get really angry. There's blood dripping off people's faces. And Isu steps back into the town and everyone stops fighting when they see that his hat is red on one side and black on the other. And Isu says, everyone will always have a different perception of reality to you. But that's never a reason to turn to violence. The Yoruba faith specifically is relativistic in the way that it's practiced. It's orally practiced. There's no one doctrine that, like a Bible that the religion is kind of centered around. The religion itself is very much defined by the, the stories of, of the gods and the Patekis. Um, they are 
there are hundreds of, of stories. I mean, there's hundreds of gods and each one of them has stories about them. As Yoruba was brought to the rest of the world through the slave trade, to places like Cuba and Trinidad, and all of the Antilles, Haiti, because it's already practiced, it was free to, to expand to all these different ways of interpreting these integral processes and these forces of, of nature and of, of, of human understanding of nature. In the story that I told, um, that was just one version of the story. And one of the fantastic things about the Yoruba patikis, they're called just like folk folkloric stories, um, is that they are c different from, from village to village, from country to country, from continent to continent. People, because it's an orally practiced religion, they're free to, to change and to be interpreted in different ways. I think there is unlimited amounts of things that we can learn from looking at these folk tales and looking at the deities and looking at the ways, the various ways that they've been interpreted in different countries and in different times and by different peoples. I would say that the things that it can teach us about kind of international perceptions of each other across continents, they're immeasurable because it's constantly changing and growing and has been for thousand, almost 2,000 years. It's a lot easier to simplify things down so that we can digest them and we can make sense of them. But in reality, I think that it's always a good idea to really try and understand things from a few different perspectives. The artist has the privilege to be able to do this in a way which can be enjoyed as well as, 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 well as being quite sad or moving or, you know, hard to, hard to deal with. I am Ali Abdulazai, a poet from Iran. Isn't she beautiful? This is my brother, and this my father. If only he knew how door to door I am now. Poor innocent thing. This one is Sarah, the youngest. This is smiley face also. Can't remember the name. Exile, exile, what havoc it wreaks on my memory. She's my eldest sister. She used to pass out laughing when shooting pictures. I'm lost how these pictures of lips that have smiled now are movies of eyes that have cried. Leave it. But how mixed up I am. Poor dear, my peasant mom, if freedom ever pays Iran a visit, you'll become my father's new bride. And after breakfast, my sister will burn frankincense to smudge around my head and dispel the bad eye on my having a Layla in the night most. And my mom, while boasting, will be throwing confetti and ululating in the paddy at the bottom of the garden. So her son, may I up the lap of this lass and be turned on, I'm turned on. Now that we are in trowel shoulder to shoulder in the hall of this house, why not make believe we are wrapped in the bliss of rice paddies? Let's go. In Iran, I was teaching uh, in university because I studied mechanical engineering. As a writer, I published nine books there. The last books I published in my country called Society and uh, Cinema. Um, they censored the, these books. After this censorship, I published these two books on internet. Uh, then they called me to police, of police station, and after that, uh, I came um, out and uh, I made a decision to go live Iran. They was controlling my phone, my telephone, everything. My problem is not about the government. It's about the politics. It's about the direction of politics, you know? It's about what's happening here, you know? We can't live better. But I had to leave my country because my government is not Iranian. We didn't choose that government. They choose that government because of oil. That's the reason. All Iranian intellect, intellectuals, they are left. 
they are against West. But when they left their country, they came here. In a point, that's my new idea. We have to finish this war. You're my brother. You're my, you can be my best friend. We have to speak. I, mean, I don't believe about this is Persian, this is English. I, I'm an English poet now who lives in Persian. In my country, they killed me. I have a new birth here, you see? But this kind of birth, this kind of speaking means, okay, this is enemy. I don't want to make other, other space for being enemy because all people can be friends and to speak each other. In Iran, I know something about West philosophy and wisdom in Iran, in all Persian. I'm mixing between them. I like poetry because poetry is a way for peace. That's the reason always we need poetry. We need novel, we need imagination. This world is a big imagination. I wish when I'm dying, I think I was good. I do my own job, I do my belief. That's the reason I'm writing poetry. My name is Karl Zechinder. I'm an artist from a group called Extra in Austria. Frontiers is a, a computer game. It's basically two parties. You have refugees and you have border guards, and you follow the journey of a refugee, uh, like five stations uh, towards Europe. Do you have papers to prove your identity? How did you travel? Who brought you here? Please describe the trip. Did you have to pay them any money? Uh, why? Did you, did you, did you... I think there are various reasons why we why we started Frontiers. At first, I think uh, migration as a as a topic was always in the back of our minds, and we wanted to do something with it, and had to come um, along uh, with the right idea to do it. We see Frontiers in a kind of like a bridge function because there's a lot of information in the media, and so we hope to like create markers on a kind of mind map. So if you see Ceuta, uh, the enclave, uh, Spanish enclave in, in, uh, in Morocco, uh, if you see that uh, in our game and you play it and you play it once again and then uh, you hear it in the news again, you see it in the news again, you know, oh, there's something I can connect with it. So maybe some bits of information uh, don't just wash through like white noise like they most often do, uh, but they, you, you, are able to to get them, and this is something. So this is this is one main function, I think. And we, overall, for sure, we hope to to change the the perception of of what what brings what what is the refugees plight on European borders. What do they uh, what do they experience and it might create, or we hope it creates, uh, empathy, so that you understand what um, what a refugee goes through on his journey, on her journey. Who threatened you? And how did this support this is my life. Who brought you here? Tell me their names. Did you have to pay them any money? And why did you leave? Why do you want asylum? This, this project Frontiers, and maybe more so a new project we are into 
which is uh, even more based on personal experiences. And we collected a, a panorama of personal experiences in Kenya and Uganda. Uh, they they try to give um, migrants um, like you remember faces, you remember uh, situations. So you're working against this kind of uh, amnesia that it's like a, a faceless mass of people. Um, this is this is something I think uh, Frontiers is working very much against. This is a challenge to the mainstream media. It's a challenge to journalists as a whole. Um, to be able to use the technology and produce content in a way that's accessible, that tells these stories and produces a greater diversification of stories and finds that audience with the growing number of people who are on the internet that's not going to be um, limited by uh, geography or by philosophy. Uh, it's going to be people who are connected in their interest to particular subjects. And you may find that there are subjects um, that are finding audiences in places you, you would never have imagined they could be, and yet there will be that connection between people across those, those traditional state boundaries. I think the last person who knew everything died several hundred years ago. Um, human knowledge is so expansive now that it's completely impossible to know the world. And when you talk, when you know, you get into stuff like theoretical physics, good luck. <laughs> so. Can you understand the world? If that's what you mean, no, then no, you, you simply cannot understand the world. But if you mean, can you operate in the world? Can you be a, a well-informed person? Uh, yes, you can.